Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Stefan. This is Jose and um, Mark. And we are going to talk about uh, converting traditional apps to containerized applications on OpenStack. Um, InternApp uh, is the uh, public cloud provider uh, that uh, CrowdStar is using for this, and they'll get more into detail of that. So let me first uh, talk to you about our offering. Uh, essentially, InternApp provides cloud uh, services, which include bare metal, managed hosting, and colocation as well. We believe uh, we want to provide um, the best infrastructure for all enterprise, whether uh, enterprise needs from an infrastructure standpoint. Director of Product Management, you can reach me by email, Santuan at InternApp, or follow me on Twitter to get some information on our companies, technologies in general. Um, so let me get right to it. INAP is a uh, infrastructure provider that is available in 20, that has 20 data centers globally uh, distributed. Uh, out of those 20, we have seven that are OpenStack powered. So last year at, this, at the Tokyo Summit this time, we launched our bare metal service uh, off Ironic. Um, which we have uh, brought to seven different locations in the US, EMEA, and APAC. We have uh, roughly about 20,000 uh, cores available for our users and 2,000 servers currently active under Ironic, providing all sorts of uh, services to end users. We also have a petabyte of storage uh, currently being offered uh, available and we have 15,000 servers that are still waiting to be onboarded into Ironic. Um, there's a talk that happened about just a few hours ago from one of my colleagues highlighting the project of taking the existing servers that we had under a custom-built orchestration and onboarding those into the Ironic uh, management for OpenStack so that we can be solely focused on uh, OpenStack. We use all of these wonderful things to uh, provide the best uh, hosting, ad tech, gaming, big data analytics companies uh, infrastructure for their own uh, purposes. OpenStack, obviously, we are here because we are open source minded, but that open source uh, does not stop uh, with OpenStack. Uh, many of the logos that you see right now are in the marketplace. Uh, they have done the uh, open source um, community uh, participation, and we use them in various uh, ways, whether it be from the full gamut of operating systems that are available either virtually or physically, or underpinning Supermicro for the actual servers that we deliver, Juniper Networks uh, for our networking and Cisco as well, routing and sorts, Intel, we are a platinum provider. Uh, we use their uh, high-performance SSDs, NVMe, looking forward to the 3D cross point. Again, all of these things to provide our customers with uh, what we believe is a performance, best-in-class performance infrastructure as a service. Getting right to that. So we essentially have three uh, big labels under our main um, deployment, which is um, Agile Cloud for the, for the virtual instances, Agile Server, which we branded for the bare metal, and Agile Storage, which encompasses both our Swift for the object store and our block storage for the persistence um, storage that is available for the virtual um, based on SolidFire, and hopefully in the future also we'll be tagging that to the bare metal as well. All of this open stack, obviously for us, the commitment is so that our uh, customers such as CrowdStar can pick a standard API to consume, whether it be virtual, physical, and have a single pane of uh, entry point for all of their infrastructure management services. So our open stack deployment is essentially the core services today. Uh, Swift, Keystone, Nova, Neutron, Cinder, Glance, um, so that we can obviously render um, you know, the basic uh, services. We uh, take the core uh, packages uh, from the repos and deploy it ourselves with our own recipes based on Puppet and Ansible. Uh, we don't use a, a branded uh, um, label like a Mirantis or such or Canonical to deploy it. This is all in-house. We have the skill set. And on top of that, we obviously have Horizon, so our customers can go in and consume. The API is readily available uh, with some limitations on Neutron, but Cillimeter, Heat, Ironic, 
um, are also exposed uh, to the customers, which allow CrowdStar to consume and deploy. How do we offer these? What do we use all of those modules for? Essentially, as I've stated, virtual instances. So if you do a nice flavor list as a tenant, you will get what is called the A uh, flavors, which are our oversubscribed um, virtual instances, the B, which are not oversubscribed, so no noisy neighbor. You get the full power of the hypervisor. In our instance, it's KVM that is available to you uh, to the point of the B116, which is the largest one we have to offer, which is physically half a dual socket computer that is uh, at the customer's disposal. On top of that, uh, we have the uh, eight flavors of bare metal that are equally available, consumable, just like a virtual instance, spin up, spin down. Obviously, the delivery time is a little bit longer on a physical server versus a virtual instance, um, but all of the billing by the second or monthly or spin up re-image uh, capabilities are available and both of these share the same networking um, VLANs assignments, subnets and so on. So uh, seamless integration or experience for our customers. Um, so what differentiates us? Um, obviously as a public cloud provider many of these things are, are not new to you but what we have chosen is uh, networking first and the reason for that is um, as you listen to talks and as you deploy your applications, performance of being able to deliver data uh, across the plane from first servers to VMs, between servers, Hadoop clusters, um, heavy loaded uh, web front ends, caching, and so on. So for us, without a good network, there's uh, nothing um, of value that can be given. So we started with the network first. and so. Um, there are actually currently at this talk some spec talks over some of what we've already done, which is at the bare metal provide a bonded uh, interface or the bonding of two physical interfaces and trunking VLANs to the customer. That way the customer gets better resiliency at the server level and the flexibility of attaching the VLANs that they want. So for us, on that LACP bond, uh, networks are pre-populated, hence the limitation on Neutron, and the customers can attach, detach whatever VLANs they want on whichever bare metal instances or virtual instances they want to be able to create a complex uh, application or cluster or environment that may be segregated for production, staging, UAT, and so forth, right? That being said, infrastructure as a service isn't always cloudy. That's not necessarily a bad thing because obviously we only have a limited set of virtual instances. We have a limited set of bare metal that is readily available to our customers, but we also pushed it a little bit further. Why? Because in some complex applications or designs or needs from our customers, we realized that, well, we would never be able to inventory all the permutations that would be required to satisfy all the needs. So we have three categories um, of the service for the bare metal, which we call deploy on demand, which is the eight flavors that are readily available, continuously stocked, available through the CLI or Horizon. And then on top of that, we added what we call upgrade on demand, which is a selection of 72 different permutation that you can obtain. We deliver to the customer, make it available, and then that private flavor is uh, exposed to you, right? Whereas the others are all public, the, li the, li the latter um, is private to the tenant or to that customer. Um, and then above and beyond that, if really we get into extreme cases, well then we may build a custom flavor because we have to build a custom configuration to satisfy a very particular customer need. And speaking of particular customer needs, none of this stops the customers from doing whatever they want ultimately, as we currently do not have a container as a service uh, offering. Uh, we are definitely working to get CoreOS on board, reaching out to the different uh, container vendors. But right now, as we are focusing on the infrastructure, but nothing stops our customers from being extremely flexible. And I think that's the real focus of the talk and I'll let uh, the CrowdStar folks uh, get right to it. Jose. Thanks, Stefan. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for you know, being here with us today, last day of the conference. I'm sure everybody's tired and ready to go party, probably. 
Um, so a little bit about Crowdstar. I, I covered a lot of this during um, the keynote yesterday, but I want to give you a little bit of uh, a view of how the game and the operation works and why that created challenges for us that we needed to uh, solve in some way. Um, so the way that the, the Covet Fashion application works is that it's, it's actually driven by events, right? So there is events that are delivered daily uh, that have a specific theme that um, the women around the world have to dress for. And all these looks are actually being submitted and stored as data in our system. Um, once the event uh, period ends, all those looks need to be rendered uh, and displayed for voting, right? So everybody goes and votes on all these looks. And the rendering process was one of the main things that was causing a lot of uh, headaches for us. Because it's, it's a situation of like, we can't pre-render the infinite um, combinations of looks that they can create for a specific event. So we needed to create a system that would be able to render them on real time as they were getting hit. Um, and we started doing this on, on, um, on a KVM infrastructure and everything. Uh, and we would scale it up and get ready with loads of additional <laughs> available infrastructure just to heat those, those peaks of um, events going into voting. Once we were able to render them, then we would cache them and store them on, on CDNs and things like that. So we were able to reduce that workload afterwards. But getting the, spinning those things up really quick um, was kind of like one of the challenges. Um, so we started working on, on, on virtualized parts and we would you know, preheat our cluster um, and everything. Uh, but it was still the performance of each render was not great enough. And that's where like Ironic and Bare Metal really made a difference because it gave us access to the raw power of those CPUs, right? And it also allowed us to run way less servers up you know, at the period. And also because Ironic allowed us to just launch servers. And like you said, they, they launch a little slower than, than normal uh, KVM instances. But it's still that preheat period would be, you know, very simple for us. And just the performance gains uh, from originally the first public cloud that we were working with uh, to going to bare metal, we were able to drop about 110 milliseconds off of our total time, uh, which when you're hitting about, I think we were rendering about 100, and 50,000 in that first 10 minutes of, of, um, of the, um, the event going live. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of very hits, so having all that available power was great. Um, the other thing was spinning these things up. These machines were kind of dependent, and that's where the container stack really started changing that for us because now um, you know, we were kind of like diverting resources from one side to the other, and uh, some servers had specific configurations or, or um, libraries most more than anything uh, that were available for like the API stack, right? Um, and all these servers that we were spinning up, they were being wasted some of the time. And starting to move to containers was, uh, the argument for us was, okay, well, if we create the agnostic layer um, of infrastructure where we don't care about what, what the server is, there's no dependencies on the libraries, making sure that everything is the same and things like that, um, we, we were able to then better utilize that, that layer of, of compute power that we had. Uh, there were issues in conflicting libraries where we would have to launch maybe three instances to be able to run a node service, a Ruby service, and a PHP service because of the, you know, some was Ubuntu, uh, the others were uh, CentOS, and there were a lot of limitations. So taking that sort of out of the equation and having uh, the container stack uh, be agnostic uh, of what the hardware was, allowed us also to spin up these worker nodes uh, through containers and the orchestration that Mark's gonna kind of show you guys uh, to be able to take care of these loads. So um, now I'm gonna have um, Mark, who's our head of DevOps at CrowdStart, to give you guys a little bit of the workflow that we've done and, um, and you know, get some ideas out of it. Thank you. Hey guys, um, again, thanks for coming at such a late stage. Uh, I'm Mark, and again, as Tachi said, head of DevOps. And it was about last year, beginning of, beginning of last year, um, that we had transitioned from our old data center into InterNAP, and we were running on OpenStack. But through that process, it was a case of we realized that our application wasn't as portable as we would like, and we needed to change this. Um, one of the, the main issues, again, is, as uh, Jose said, the, the initialization of the nodes where it was quite long, it was like 
uh, we were, it was a case of, it was a, over a period of time when you uh, developed the application, it was a three year, uh, so far three years, um, the application's been running, but over that three years, uh, your um, initialization um, scripts tend to get bloated. So we wanted to try and like simplify that. Again, uh, to use the more uh, more efficiently of the nodes, and, and when we were running multiple products, multiple like say an API or the render um, application, um, they tend not to run on the same uh, infrastructure. Uh, so it was a case of we would like to try and uh, bring them together, or at least have a cluster of servers that would could be multifunctional. Um, and uh, yeah, so I said uh, the the chef files throughout the development process, they, they don't diverge. Um, we were using Ganglia for time series data and uh, Magius for alerting. Ganglia is great to set up, it's really easy um, to send metrics to. However, it, the structure of Ganglia is a, a hierarchical structure, so it needs to be kind of slightly fixed. It's not too easy to uh, automatically update. Um, and it's difficult for end users to write uh, custom graphs. They, they require like PHP knowledge. Magius has been around forever. Uh, everyone uses it. Um, loads of plugins for everybody. Um, but it was built before the container landscape. And um, again, it, it's kind of fixed in its uh, configuration. And when we're launching boxes up and down and containers are running, you, you don't have a defined place for a container to, to run um, unless you have a management script to constantly update those uh, Nagios configurations. It, it's difficult. Um, and also, the code deployment was uh, long. Um, it ran through multiple Jenkins jobs to, to get it uh, right and then push it out to the end servers. So yeah, we were using Chef to, to instantiate all the nodes. Um, uh, you multiple recipes to set up individual uh, functionality. Um, PHP, Nginx, um, maybe different IP tables, you know yourself. Um, again, over the life cycle, comes out of sync from what's actually running on the boxes. If you want to do something quickly, or if I got a request to install a library from a developer, I just run across, to, and it needed to be done like yesterday, um, because they never told me, um, to, to just hack it out and just throw it out onto the servers and get it up and running. Um, again, there's this, uh, the, we wanted to see if we could separate the infrastructure so it, we didn't care what, what the infrastructure um, was going to run, um, but at the time was, they were too tightly coupled. Uh, and also there was no guarantee that what was in the recipes was actually running on dev after if I go and change something and don't go back and update my recipes. So um, again, moving to containers, what, there was four things I kind of really wanted. Standardize everything, give power back to the developers, so if they did want to install some particular library, they could just throw it into the container and I didn't have to do anything. I could look at it and make sure like, yeah, you're not doing something silly. Um, it simplified the deployments and then guarantee whatever is running on their local um, Docker uh, environment that when that went rolled out to um, staging or QA and then went out to production, it was exactly the same, exactly the, the correct libraries and um, the, the code base. So what did we decide to do um, to solve the, the instantiation problem? We, we had a, we're just using the, the Nova API to uh, call out to get access to compute or ironic resources. And then we decided to stick with like as the bare minimum that you could go with for, now we haven't switched over to um, CoreOS yet, but that's down the, the pipeline. And uh, we were using CentOS and there's issues running CentOS on a, a loopback device in a, a, a device mapper, the link there why friends don't let friends run device mapper in production. Go have a look at it. 
Um, so the, the cloud um, configuration was really simple. Booted it up from a, a Nova API call, updated uh, all the packages that were currently in the image or in the flavor, uh, initialized the users that we needed, added the Docker repo, installed Docker, registered with our DNS, added a few name servers that we needed, and then registered with our Rancher orchestration system, which I'll get into. So tips in Docker files that I kind of came through. Initially, why I had the code bases for the, the, the main code base of the application and my Docker uh, configuration separate. Don't do that. To put the Docker file into your code base. Um, and if you can, and it makes sense, put your config files for your um, the various environments into your code base as well. Like just stick it in. It, it, it streamlines the building of the images. And then leverage your environment variables when you start the container to switch over between which environment you're going to be in. So if you're running locally on like uh, your uh, dev workstation and you want maybe xdebug for PHP or there was more uh, different config files, just set which uh, environment you want to run in. That means everything's the same. You have a single entry point and it, the entry point manages the uh, environment state. This is a little bit controversial to use a process manager with inside a Docker. Some people like say, no, you shouldn't do it, but if it makes sense and it's, it's okay with you, then I don't see a problem with it. Um, again, it's controversial. Uh, tag your images when you're building them to like a, a standard uh, naming convention across all your products. You know exactly what it's supposed to be. Um, and just stick to it. This is just an example. You can make up your own, uh, and it makes sense to us when we're running it. So we use Supervisor for some of the, the, the um, containers we use. And one of the reasons was that previous to Docker 1.2, there wasn't any health checks inside of a container. So Inside of um, Supervisor, you start your program. You, there's an example uh, program definition, and then it, you, you, you create a, an event listener that Supervisor D will throw out events every, in this example, it's a, a tick 60. It's listening for that tick 60 um, event, and then once it receives that event from Supervisor D, it'll run the health check. It, in case, in a situation where a process becomes stale, it may not die off the, off the, the process may not die, it still may be live, but it may not be responding. So that's a, a perfect example for it to check to make sure that the actual process is running correctly. And if it doesn't, pro, uh, it'll send a signal to Supervisor D to restart it. Um, again, with the monitoring, we wanted a, a flexible approach. We didn't want to be st stuck in a, a, a structure, a, a, a very fixed structure. And we didn't want to go through and manually update uh, config files if boxes or containers launched. And the ability for end users to create dashboards on their own without having the PHP knowledge. Again, to, for logging information, I uh, wanted a centralized log system and uh, not to have multiple syslog configurations. Again, just try and standardize across the, the board. So what we did was, we moved over to a, a, a service discovery, and we're using console. There's multiple ones out there. Um, but we just picked console for, for us. And then for the time series data and alerting, uh, Prom Prometheus and uh, Ganglia, or sorry, Grafana. And for the application, we just used a, an Elk stack. So the way we set up the, the main hosts that talk to console, we, there's a, a single container that registers with our console server and then advertises what services that that node will be offering. On a, on a base level, all the hosts will run a, a node exporter and C advisor to get access to see uh, what's going on inside the containers and then what the, the actual node is, is uh, reporting. There's a, a, an example screenshot. Um, all the services are on the left and then there's a, a service defined node exporter with all the IPs that that, um, 
services uh, running on. And then Prometheus connects to uh, our console cluster uh, using a, a URL, consoleexample.com is then dash uh, config uh, example. And then it, it asks console what services I really want to be interested in. And if, for example, there's C Advisor and Node Exporter. The way uh, Prometheus expects results to come back is on a, on a HTTP metrics URL. Um, and it hits each of the uh, hosts. So there's an example of some um, C advisor metric data that's coming from a, a host, and then Prometheus will parse it and put it into its uh, time series uh, database. And here's a, a visualization of um, the time series data from uh, Grafana. So as for the application log data, we wanted to simplify the process, you, you can add drivers onto your uh, Docker Compose file to say which driver you want to send it to. We, we just didn't want to, we wanted to send everything to um, uh, Elasticsearch so we could process it later on. So there is an example of raw logs coming off in the red, um, coming from a, a, a container. So we have log spout that connects to the, to the Docker socket it reads all the logs coming from every single container on the box and then forwards it onto Logstash, again, through Elasticsearch to index it, and then we can visualize it in, uh, in Kibana. There's a screenshot of Kibana example. So this is the, this is a, the basic node, a high level of what is on a single node or all, what's on every uh, simple node before it gets a, a workload to, to process. Um, and it, it, I think it's pretty obvious there what's, what's going on. Um, the, the only thing we haven't mentioned there is the rancher agent, and that's the orchestration um, system that we're using, and that, that talks to uh, rancher. So the, the flow goes console, the registrator talks to console, and then it'll expose that time series data, and then logs about forwards the, the, the application log data and uh, container data, container log data to Logstash. So here's uh, an example of uh, a workload in the cluster, and this is what we actually run. Um, on OpenStack, um, it, we could use either compute or bare metal. Um, once a node comes into Rancher, then it's available to do work, and then on the, on the persistent layer, we were just using bare metal um, and because they're long running processes for, uh, for data, for Couchbase and uh, SQL and cache. So the, the deployment, we, we were we, at the back, back in beginning of last year, we did a little bit, of, we did a lot of research and it was still very early on in stages between what um, orchestration system was going to come out as the best. So the handy thing about Rancher is it supported Cattle its own um, orchestration environment, but the, was on the roadmap to support Kubernetes, Mesios, and Swarm. So we went with that, and then over the period of time when we were using it, that support came online. Now, how do you define your application? Um, it, the, the Rancher catalog is basically a library of pre-written um, applications with uh, configurations for, and they're written in Docker, Docker Compose, your normal Docker Compose files, and then there's a Rancher Compose, which is used for scaling or various particular settings of where it should run, or, or, or um, it, it's, it's more to do with uh, Rancher. Um, but at the moment, um, it only currently supports Docker Compose files version one, not version two. I think it's coming down the line in the, maybe the next release, uh, but we'll see. So this, it, when we're building the containers, what happens is we use GitLab's continuous integration, and once a Git uh, commit comes in on a particular stat or particular branch, we'll issue a, a build. And this, this build here, you can see the script is running uh, the container manager. It runs, it builds the tag, then builds the image, pushes the images out to Docker Hub, builds the, cat, the Rancher catalog from a set of templates, 
um, that's all up, that we've put into the, the Git repo for the, the Rancher catalog. And then it calls back out to Rancher to ping, to say, update your, uh, the private catalog. So here's the, the flow again, pushes it to GitLab, triggers the pipeline, and then builds tests, um, builds the Rancher catalog, and then calls out to either up deploy or upgrade the stack. Now, this is a, a live demo. We'll see how we go. Um, there's two uh, URLs there, the voting demo.crowds.com and results demo.crowds.com. It's the standard um, Docker example project. Uh, where you, you're voting, uh, it goes into the queue, and then there's a Java worker now pulling the queue off and adding it to the, the storage. So let's see if we can just do the demo. So here's a, uh, I might have to actually refresh this. And, okay. So here's the, here's the, uh, the view of um, Rancher, and these are all the stacks we are currently running. Um, in the, we are currently running this on the Rancher is on a single node, and then we have two um, worker nodes that are connected into Rancher that Rancher is actually managing. Um, the only part of Rancher that you need to be careful of is the MySQL database that that it's running, and um, that's the the persistent state of the the orchestration system. So we need to mine that and, and make sure that that's safe. So in um, the load balancer, with their, each of these um, stacks, um, here's, the, here's the, the actual uh, demo Docker app. And we have a load balancer, and it's pointing, it has a few ACLs that are pointing out to uh, different URLs. So here's the voting and results, and and we have our GitLab running as well. Now, so if we go to our Grafana and see, this is this is the one that's taking all the, the time series data in from um, the uh, containers and also the the host metrics. And again. This is far easier to, for an end user to uh, create graphs. So here's a view of Cabana. There's no data in it at the moment because we're it's constantly updating. So we'll see if we can go and just reload this. Now we're going, to, we're going to send in a vote, and notice that the vote will be processed by probably a different worker. And then here's the actual log that's actually popped in from uh, live from the from the container. So here's the the it's updated from the the the, the, the node um, application, and we we're going to change it now live. So we have a um, I've created a merge request into the uh, OpenStack branch that the, the pipeline is uh, monitoring. So this looks OK. We'll see who. Um, we go and click on to accept the merge request. So if we go to the pipeline, hopefully we're running. We're building our stack. So this is actively running. And it's building the three um, images. It's uploading them to uh, Docker Hub. So now it's gone and built the the version that we want for, oh, yeah, we've gone and built the, the um, Rancher Compose catalog entry, and it's updated with the correct um, version and the hash of the, uh, from, from Git. So then if we go back into our catalog and refresh, or sorry, into the stacks, 
you'll see now, it, it's monitoring that uh, Git repo where all our, our catalog entries are. So this is the, uh, the catalog view of our own private Git repo. And then this is the standard one you, you generally see. So in the stack, notice we have cats versus dogs. We're going to do an upgrade. We select the version that we've just built. Hopefully that's the right one. 34. Oh. Let me see. Grade 11. So it's upgrading. Let's refresh. So we've switched over to the new branch. And um, again, if we refresh this, we've the new version. Now, again, if we go back to this, it should update. I don't know if I do. Did I vote there? I don't think I voted. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, and there they are. So that's the kind of the whole process throughout um, from a, a git commit all the way out to uh, deploying the, the, the full stack. So let's go back here. So what, what we've done, we've, we've sorted out the, um, the, the long initialization period. Um, we're using uh, Nova and uh, the cloud in it configurations. It's, it's very generic and it's multi-purpose. Now we have consistency between environments and again, the logic has been decoupled from the infrastructure and there's no dependency between nodes. And then most importantly, we've given uh, developers more control uh, and they have access if they want to add new libraries. Um, and again, the, we can guarantee that uh, code being pushed and created gets, is guaranteed to be correct on all those environments. So I think I'm going to be putting this code back up on GitHub. This is the URL if you want to go get it. Um, and I think we can have any questions. Okay, uh, I think we'll call it there. And thanks for coming. Cheers. Thanks, guys.